you're asked to answer the following questions. First, do you affirm your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior and accept his covenant promises made to you and to your children as proclaimed in the Bible and confessed in this church of Christ? And second, do you believe that our children, though sinful by nature, are indeed received by God in Christ as members of his covenant community and therefore should receive the sign of that covenant, baptism? And third, do you promise in reliance on the Holy Spirit, with the help of the Christian community, to do all that you can to instruct your children in the Christian faith and life, to teach them the scriptures, to pray for them and teach them to pray, and so by word and example lead them to be Christ's disciple? Mike and Holly Robson, what is your answer? And Kurt and Maria Sickens, what is your answer? I invite the congregation to stand for a moment. And answer the following question. Do you, the people of the Lord, receive Alice and Natalia into the Lord's covenant community in Christ? Do you promise to love them, to pray for them, to help instruct them in the word and in faithful living, and to encourage and sustain them in the fellowship of believers as times and circumstances require? Brothers and sisters in Christ, what is your answer? Thank you. You may be seated. We'll do Robson's first. That's what I'm for. We're doing it alphabetically, that's all. <laughs> Jesus said, Let the little children come to me. Do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Alice Elizabeth Robson, child of God's covenant community in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Natalia Rose Sickens, child of God's covenant community in Christ, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We're going to pray together in a moment. Just before we do so, I want to offer you also resources and a certificate of baptism, if you want to take that, um, from our church here, Mike and Holly. As we continue in our participation in our children's lives in ways that disciple. I invite you all stand together. We're going to pray a prayer of blessing. Let's pray together. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we thank you that you wash away our sins. You make us new persons in Jesus Christ through grace alone. So today we want to pray for Natalia and for Alice. Bless and strengthen them daily with the gift of your Holy Spirit. Unfold to them the riches of your love. Grant them your Spirit's gift of a growing faith. Protect them from sin and evil. Enable them to live holy and blameless lives until your kingdom comes in all its fullness. And bless Amelia as an older sister to Natalia. May she too be a rich blessing to her in growing up, knowing you and your love in Jesus. And look with kindness on Kurt and Maria and Mike and Holly. Let them always rejoice in the gift you have given them. Give them the strength as parents, uh, the wisdom that they need of your Holy Spirit, that they may bring up their children to know you, love you, serve you, and their neighbor. And Father, bless all your little ones here who are growing up as part of your covenant people. May they grow in the faith, hope, and love found only in the gift of grace through faith in Jesus Christ our Lord. And Lord, may we as a congregation be equipped by your Spirit to walk together in faithfulness to the promises we have made before you here today. To you, our Savior God, be all glory and honor and praise forever and ever. And all God's children say, Amen. You may be seated. already lit here if you can see that this is part of our tradition in advent looking forward to christ coming at christmas 
So last Sunday, we lit the candle of hope and were reminded to put our hope in God's promises of a peaceful kingdom. On this second Sunday of Advent, we light the candle of love. Our God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. That's from John 3.16. We lit this candle to remember God's love, which brings joy to the world and peace on earth. Let's sing together. with us, we confess how hard it is for us to wait. Like Zechariah, we have had, we have a hard time waiting on you and we lose hope so quickly when it seems as though you aren't answering our prayers in the ways we hope. But sometimes your timing is mysterious. And sometimes you answer our longings and our prayers in ways we have a hard time comprehending. Lord, take away all the barriers in our lives that keep us from being able to hear you, to know you and to love you with all our hearts. Give us ears to hear your gentle voice saying, do not be afraid. In Jesus' name we pray. God's people said, amen. I've offered to help us with this next song. So Connor and Danny and Derek, can you come up? We have a few signs. 
we want to just visually help us to hear this song, this message from the angel that do not be afraid. What do they say? Dan, can you tell us what they say really loud? Yes, do not fear. So we pray that this next song would be a prayer of blessing on you, that you hear the message from the angel, do not fear.
this time our junior youth, grades 5 to 8, can go as they continue their worship and learning in another part of the church. That's grade 5 to 8. Just trying to space them out a little bit as they leave. We have a couple groups leaving. And then the junior gems and junior cadets, you can go. younger they get, the faster they go out. I don't <laughs> and then also the Bethany kids ages three and four, the three and four year olds, you can go as well now. At that age, most of the kids are sure mom or dad needs to come as well. Let's come to God in our prayer. Lord Jesus, numerous times you spoke to your disciples and through your words speak to us the words do not fear and in this world in this time lord there is much fear a lot of the fear has been turning to anger at different people and different perspectives and lord people are struggling people are afraid of of what has been happening this past year with the virus they're afraid of the impact this will have on their lives long term and yet you invite us do not fear but to come and trust in your care, in your provision, in the hope that you give. So, Lord, we do pray for a, a healing around this world from the pandemic. We thank you, Lord, for all who are working diligently to care for those who are ill. And, Lord, we pray for strength and for endurance for them. In many situations around the globe, Lord, it is overwhelming. And we pray, Lord, for leadership in those countries and, and Lord, in the global community to provide what is needed. And Lord, we pray also for the provision of food and shelter and livelihood for the many that are thrust into poverty at this time because of what has been going on. They often, Lord, do not hit the news. But Lord, they are dear to your heart. You know all of us. And Lord, we want to pray also for the difficulties of isolation, especially where, where addiction is being battled, Lord, and also where mental health conditions are worsened by isolation and by the lack of community. And Lord, we pray that in those situations you might be there powerfully by your Holy Spirit to bring healing and strength and endurance, to uphold and to give peace and comfort. We pray also, Lord, for those who are caring for people in those situations, Lord, that you give them all wisdom and insight, that you give them also endurance based in your will and your strength, based in your spirits surrounding them with your power. Lord, there are many organizations in our communities that are working with those who are in a more deeper need, especially now in this situation. And so, Lord, we, we pray for some of them. We pray for hands at work, Lord. We pray for Roots Niagara. We pray for safe families. We pray for family outreach. We pray for the children and family services, Lord, in our communities. We pray for Rose City Kids and, and other organizations that are working hard at this time to continue to support um, households and individuals who are struggling, who are in crisis who are in need of, of simply a place to, to live and be. We pray, Lord, that we may continue to keep our eyes and ears open and our hearts willing to step forward in hope and in, in, in giving what you're calling us to give. And also, Lord, to serve in the ways that you're inviting us to serve. We want to pray also, Lord, for our witness as a church here in this community and, Lord, and for as believers in, our, in a variety of communities that we're a part of. We pray, Lord, a blessing on the efforts for the parade display that we're putting up, and we pray, Lord, that also you will bless the walkthrough service in a couple of weeks, that in these ways, Lord, we may be reminded of the good news that is found in Jesus Christ and is free to all who will receive it. So, Lord, we are grateful for that, and we become even more grateful when our lives go into difficulty and we turn to you and we discover you are always faithful, that you uphold us even through the difficulties that we face. We want to lift up to you, Lord, those who are dealing with illness or injury. 
We think of Bill, Lord, and Tatiana, Valerie, Ann, Bob, others, Lord, and our family and friend circles and our communities, Lord, who are wrestling with difficulties, who are going through illness, who are dealing with injuries. Lord, we pray for your healing hand there. And we pray for your comforting hand. We pray especially, Lord, for those who are in hospital, who, Lord, for them it is very isolating. And often, Lord, their support communities can't access them right now. And we, we pray, Lord, that you may be present in a special way there. And, Lord, we want to pray for comfort for all those who mourn. We think in this community, Dallas's wife and the families involved. We pray, Lord, for grace and peace that goes beyond understanding that you may indeed guard our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus, and that the hope of the gospel may be especially alive in our hearts and in our witness and in our, in our grieving as well before the face of a world that is filled with grief right now. Lord, we pray also this morning for the proclamation of your word, and that, Lord, it may faithfully portray who you are, that we may be opened by your spirit to hear the good news and be encouraged, Lord, in whatever place and whatever part of the walk we are in in our lives, wherever we are, and that, Lord, whether we're worshiping here, whether we're listening in or, or worshiping online, Lord, and, and however you use this service, Lord, we pray for your Spirit's blessing on your means of grace, your holy word, and we pray this in the name of Jesus. And God's people said, amen. I invite you to turn to Luke chapter 1. In your Bibles, if you have them, 891, and I think it'll be on the overhead as well. Luke chapter 1, page 891 in many of the bench Bibles. I'm going to read verses 5 to 25. Luke chapter 1, begin reading at verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. But they had no children, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both well along in years. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshipers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to give him the name John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even from birth. Many of the people of Israel will, be, will he bring back to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, How can I be sure of this? I am an old man, and my wife is well along in years. The angel answered, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not, could not speak to them. They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. And after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. 
In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. This is the word of the Lord. I want to say thank you to all of you who have sent encouraging notes and prayers this past week as I've been dealing with um, back problems. That's why I keep on shifting my weight here. Um, You know, it's kind of like those situations where you hear your wife calling and saying, Honey, remember not to do any lifting the way your back is right now. And then you turn and go, Too late. Maybe you've done that. That's not really what happened to my back lately, but... When I went to my osteopath, whom a number of you know as well, and I'm going to tell Kyle tomorrow, he got mentioned in the sermon, he's going to be thrilled. The first thing he said to me when I walked in was, so what did you do? And I thought, well, who cares what I did? It's too late. It's too late for anything right now. Now I'm stuck in the pain. So I'm going to go to him tomorrow and keep working at this. But those few words, it's too late. It's too late. They are words that indicate disappointment, regret, defeat sometimes, sadness even. I mean, think about this. The doctor tells you to quit smoking after 30 years of smoking because smoking causes cancer, and you're thinking, well, it's too late. Why bother? Or maybe your kids are grown up and living their lives out of the inevitable reaction to the mistakes you made in your parenting. Yes, All parents make mistakes. Maybe you tried hard to be really strict, and yet once away from home, it seems that for them anything goes. Or maybe you tried to be carefree and permissive in raising them, and and you see them become super harsh in their lives, however that might go. It just feels like it's all too late. Or perhaps you did and, and said things in your life that you would love to take back now that you have the wisdom of hindsight and years but you're pretty sure it's too late. Our sinfulness and the misery we experience caused by ourselves or even by other people's evil acts inflicted on us, they can leave us looking back at those times and regretting all kinds of ways that we reacted or tried to cope. And we feel like it's too late. And as any older person knows, Looking back over your life is always an exercise in managing some regret and guilt or of using denial to hide it all away. Life can go in so many different directions, can go wrong in so many ways that nearing the latter stages, many people struggle with that and they might resign themselves to a a sort of a sense or an attitude of bitterness and regret rooted in being convinced that it's too late for them to do anything. Nothing can be done about the past anymore. Our time has come and gone, and we feel like we blew it. But what if your life was one of faithful living to the best of your ability? What if you were known in the community to be wonderfully gracious, always dedicated to the Lord in worship and service of others? What if you honored God with your life? And yet, as you enter your senior years, your one prayer for the one blessing you sought never gets answered. Maybe you're even born into a good family and the right clan. You did all you were called to do in exemplary fashion, and yet the one expected blessing from God, that Old Testament covenant blessing, has been denied to you. That's where we're at in our passage, verse 5. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, this is real history, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were upright in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commandments and regulations blamelessly. They're of the tribe chosen in ancient times by God to be the priests ministering in his presence in the temple. Their lineage firmly embedded in that calling and they're carrying out their calling wonderfully, blamelessly, without veering to the left or the right, steadfast in their dedication to the Lord over the length of their life. And then verse 7, but they had no children because Elizabeth was barren. And they were both well along in years. 
childlessness today for a married couple can be a very difficult journey to walk. But now add, in this situation, add to that for Zechariah and Elizabeth, the weight of the Old Testament covenant that God made with Abraham. Abraham would be the father of many nations and that Israel would be numerous and flourishing people and from Israel would come the descendant of Abraham who would be the Messiah to God's people. And so faithfulness to the covenant was, was to result in the covenant blessings of which was offspring. That's a part. And unfaithfulness would result in covenant curses of which barrenness was considered part. So Zechariah and Elizabeth were not just childless, but as Old Testament believers, they also failed to receive the mark of the blessing of God by having children. And that came with that extra load of stigma for them. But a note for today, the children of God are no longer the ethnic descendants of Abraham, but are in Christ by faith through the Holy Spirit. All who believe are children of the covenant promises. Childlessness is still a difficult journey for a couple, but it does not carry anymore the covenant curse. Christ took the curse on himself on the cross. But for Zechariah and Elizabeth, for those two, it was too late. They were old. God was God. They were not, and they had given up on having a child. And yet we find out that this situation was actually in God's plan all along as part of the inbreaking of salvation of God's plan at this point in history. Now here's kind of the context of, of how this has been set up by the Lord. Um, the, there's an estimate of about, there were about 18,000 priests living in and around Jerusalem and the surrounding areas who were eligible to take a turn to serve in the temple. And they were organized according to divisions so that they would in due time get an opportunity to serve. And verse, eight sa verse 8 says, Once when Zechariah's division was on duty and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. So yes, Zechariah would be able to serve in the temple at some point. They figure either once a year, maybe twice a year, as a sign to whatever the multiple duties were, but then to be chosen by lot during that time, to offer incense in the temple, that was a very rare honor indeed. In the Old Testament, the Israelites understood the casting of lots as the way that God would choose. In fact, you were only allowed that honor of serving in the temple in such a way once in your lifetime as priest. And many priests never got that opportunity. They were never chosen. Well, the incense would be offered outside the curtain that separated the holy place from the holy of holies, where only the high priest could go, and that only once a year. This was as close to the mercy seat of God that Zechariah would come ever in his life. In the center of the temple was the holy of holies. That's where the Ark of the Covenant of God was kept. And the lid of the Ark was called the Mercy Seat, had two angelic figures carved on either end, looking inwardly. And it was between there where the Lord would, would meet, would appear with his people. So that place had to be sprinkled with the blood of the atonement sacrifice for the people's sin. It was the Holy of Holies. Once a year, the high priest would enter to do that um, atonement sacrifice. And remember, after Christ's death, that curtain is torn from top to bottom. And so access is no longer through those sacrifices. It is directly through faith in Christ. But here is Zechariah before the coming of Jesus. <clears throat> He's a few steps from the most holy of places in the temple, and yet he cannot go there. Well, he goes about his duties, a wonderful opportunity to offer incense while the people are outside praying. In the Bible, incense is a visualization of the prayers of God's people rising to his throne room. You see that from all through the Old Testament all the way into the book of Revelation. But what was Zechariah and Elizabeth praying? Perhaps they had given up praying for a child. We're seniors, we're done. I mean, other than Abram and Sarah of old, seniors don't have newborns. 
it was too late for them. And that is precisely when God sends word to him via Gabriel, the angel of the Lord. An angel. You know, at this time of year, it's common to see lots of depictions of angels in all kinds of places. And if you look around us in our communities right now, the way we decorate and cards and all these sorts of things, I've never seen a depiction of an angel that is scary in any way. Have you? No, they're usually in a kind of encouraging, glittering, glowing, blessing kind of thing. Well, biblical angels are not soft, glowing, sparkling, fairy-like creatures of modern imagination. When angels appear in the Bible, it always terrifies people. And so verse 11, Then the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. That's a terrifying feeling. The angel is described as standing to the right side of the incense altar, not appeared standing next to Zechariah. His place of appearance indicates that he has been sent from the Lord God, sent in answer to the prayers of the people through Zechariah and Elizabeth's specific situation. And here we have a picture of response coming to us from God, not earned by earning a listening by being good enough for God, but God choosing to come. It was too late for Zechariah and Elizabeth to have their prayer, which they probably prayed the bulk of their lives together, too late for that prayer to be answered. And it's in that context that we find that nothing is impossible for God. And here is displayed the power and majesty of the Creator who grants a son to elderly parents. But not just any son. It's John the Baptist. It's the announcer. It's the promised one who would have the spirit and power of Elijah to prepare the way for the coming of the promised Messiah, Jesus Christ. So in this one gift here, God keeps his ancient promise of rescuing us from sin and misery. In this child, to parents for whom it was too late, the way is open, the time has come for the Messiah to bring God's salvation for all who will receive it. Gabriel's name means, God is my warrior. Angels are battle-ready messengers of God sent to carry out God's commands. And yet Zechariah can't believe it. Even though he is overwhelmed by the appearance of the angel, he's terrified for this angel has come from the presence of God and and brings with him then the, the, the glory of God in a sense that terrifies him. He's still sure it's still too late for us. And so we ask, how could I be sure of such good news? Given their whole life story of barrenness in the face of even the best efforts they could give, surely it must be too late. Gabriel tells him he was sent by God. He comes from God's presence to speak the good news. And, and, and because Zechariah could not believe it, ironically, he, he makes Zechariah unable to speak. He becomes mute till the day the promise is fulfilled in the naming of their child. Zechariah becomes a bystander in a sense to the announcement of the good news until it is fulfilled. Well, after this part, and he leaves his service of the temple. He goes back with Elizabeth to their place where they live. And his wife becomes pregnant. And her response is a little more in faith. Verse 24, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. And we don't actually know the reason for the five months seclusion, but perhaps just the awe of being pregnant after being certain it was too late for them. But Elizabeth does understand who God is. One who comes and shows favor and takes away disgrace even when we are absolutely sure it is too late for us. This way that John the Baptist, their child, comes on the scene shows clearly to us, to 
with all that God's gracious act of salvation culminating in the coming of the Messiah, this is his doing and his gift. It's not ours. The Lord here reveals himself to us as a God able and willing to save us. It's never too late for the favor and mercy of God. In Christ Jesus, by faith in God's gift of salvation, of, of forgiveness of our sins, of restoration of our relationship with the Heavenly Father and with one another, God, by His Holy Spirit, turns our, it's too late, into His perfect timing. It is never too late to turn to Christ Jesus. Even if we are sure it's too late, it's impossible, nothing can be undone of the ways I've lived or the things I've done or what has happened is just too late. It is never too late to repent of our ways, our sins, and return to the one who gave his son so that we might live. With God, all things are possible. Rescue from darkness to light, from emptiness to fullness, from regret and guilt to reconciliation and peace. All this comes from the Lord who in Christ tells each and every one of us today, it is not too late for you. Let's pray together. We praise you, Lord, God of your people, your Old Testament and New Testament people, one people you have redeemed. We praise you because you raised up a horn of salvation for us based on your promises of old you said it through your prophets. It recorded in your word, and we hear it yet today. You are faithful. We praise you because you bring salvation from our enemies, especially the enemy of our sin and brokenness, the hand of Satan in our lives, the hand of all who might hate us. But you brought us to Christ to show mercy to us, to remember your holy covenant that you swore on oath to our forefathers, the covenant you have signed and sealed once again here today. We thank you, Lord God, for the rescue you give us in Jesus Christ, and that through the power of your Holy Spirit, you enable us to serve you without fear, and to do so in holiness. All of all that we give is made right before you in Jesus, and, and in righteousness, righteousness that you give us, so that we are clothed with Christ before you all our days. We thank you for that. And Lord, as we give now too, we give in thankfulness because you've called us to be part of this ministry of reconciliation of this gospel good news in this world. And so Lord, bless this church as it continues, as we continue to strive to be your presence in this world. And Lord, bless also the works of mercy that can be done that the deacons lead us in as we give for them for that fund as well. And we pray, Lord, in all these things, uh, many may come to know that it's not too late. And now is the time of salvation in the gift of Jesus Christ. In his name we pray. Amen. At this time we have our offering giving for ministries here in Bethany and part of the Christian Reformed Church that we share in and for the Deacon's Fund.
your hearts before the Lord receive his word of blessing the same voice that speaks over the waters and calls us to follow and obey the same voice that promises I am your God you are my people the same voice that spoke this is my beloved son now blesses his people with peace so do not fear for I am with you do not be dismayed I for I am your God I will strengthen you and help you I will uphold you with my righteous right hand The blessing of Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. God's people say. And we were broken, wandering alone Looking down at our condition You sent your son to change our fate Though we were hopelessly in prison He came to take our place Glory to the name of Jesus
through Jesus' name. A stainless death has been made certain, and glory now awaits.